Welcome back. In this last unit of the lecture, we're going to talk about the expressiveness of multilayer perceptrons. In fact, a multilayer perceptron with just a hidden layer is able to approximate arbitrary continuous functions um, up to arbitrary precision if one allows to increase the number of hidden uh, units the number of neurons in a hidden layer arbitrarily. And this is quite a remarkable result and one of the fundamental results in um, deep learning. It's called the Universal Approximation Theorem. It has been shown for the first time by Sybenko uh, in a paper called Approximation by Superposition of a Sigmoidal Function and afterwards by several others in more general cases. Here's the theorem that I took from this paper. Let sigma be any continuous discriminatory function, then finite sums of the form, this form here, you recognize this form as a affine transformation plus a nonlinearity um, followed by another affine transformation here. So finite sums of the form g of x are dense in a space of continuous functions c of i n on the n-dimensional unit cube i n. In other words, given any function f out of this space of continuous functions on the unit cube and epsilon bigger than zero, there is a sum g of x for which the following holds. The uh, distance between uh, g of x and uh, f of x is smaller than epsilon for all x in the unit cube. So it's a theorem that is uh, very intuitive to understand and it has been proven for various activation functions including sigmoids and relus. However, the uh, proof is quite technical and it requires a good understanding of measure theory and uh, is probably not too hard to follow for mathematicians, um, but it's uh, beyond the scope of this class. So we're going to skip a formal proof of this theorem, where we're going to give some intuitions on some specific cases of why this holds true. And we are first going to look at the binary case. So we're looking at not the case of you know, um, continuous functions, but at the case of uh, discrete functions. <clears throat> and there it's very easy to see. So here we have an example where we have a three-dimensional input, x1, x2, x3. So there's eight possible combinations here in this table. I've just drawn three of them, but there's eight. And a one-dimensional output y that is uh, predicted by a multi-layer perceptron with hidden layer h. And both the input and the output are binary. So the input x's and the output y's can only take 0 or 1. And let's for a moment assume we these uh, hidden units are linear threshold units. Um, so they are basically um, the units that we've seen in the perceptron algorithm where um, we have an affine transformation and a comparison. So this is comparing if the result of this transformation is a bigger than zero or not. Each of these hidden neurons is connected to all input variables x. So we write bold x to encompass all these variables x1 to x3. And this bracket here is called the Iverson bracket and it returns one if the argument is true and it returns zero if the argument is not true. Okay. So we are having basically a step function that steps from zero to one exactly when ax plus b becomes bigger than zero. And then we use a um, linear combination of these step functions as our predictor. And the question is, 
can we formulate parameters a's and b's such that we can represent any possible function? And the answer is yes. And the intuition on how we're going to do this is that each of these hidden units here will recognize one, one possible input vector. Um, so one possible combination of x1, x2, and x3. So for instance, we have one neuron that's specifically tuned to recognize 0, 1, 1, which means that we will need an exponential number of hidden units to recognize all possible inputs in this binary case, which is of course not a problem um, for free input variables, but you can already see that this becomes problematic if the input dimension grows beyond this simple case. Now the question is how can we set A and B for each of these neurons that it, they are tuned to one specific input combination. And here's an example. This additional arrow here indicates the, the bias term. And we have the other um, arrows here. The, the numbers close to the arrows indicate the weights at, the, at these corresponding arrows, inputs, the weights that are multiplied with the corresponding axis. And so what you can see, so this is in black here is the setting that we have chosen for recognizing the vector 0, 1, 1 and outputting 1. And you can see that this is correct because we have chosen, you know, we have chosen 1 and 1 for x2 and x3. So they are recognizing this and we have chosen minus 1 for the first one, such that if the first one would not be 0, if it would be 1, we're lowering the um the the activation and then we have a bias of minus 0.5 which means that only if x2 and x3 are 1 and x1 is not 1 we are obtaining a number that is higher than um <clears throat> 1.5 if we put the b on the other side which is higher than 1.5 or if we subtract from 1 plus 1 if we subtract minus 1.5 we obtain 0 0.5, which is bigger than 0. Right? But if we would change this x1 to 1, then we would subtract 1 again, and we would obtain 1, which is not bigger than um, uh, 1 minus uh, 1.5, which is not bigger than 0, because it's minus 0 0.5. So as you can see, we can design these units and their weights in a way that each of these units um, corresponds or recognizes one particular situation and then outputs the corresponding um, value here. Okay. However, we need 2 to the power of d, an exponential number of units to recognize all possible inputs. And this is the binary case. It becomes even more problematic if we have the continuous case. Now, one thing that we've assumed here is that we have linear threshold units. And of course, learning linear threshold units is hard as the gradient is zero almost everywhere and you know, they are not differentiable. So the solution here um, is to replace the hard threshold units with soft threshold units, such as sigmoids. So here you can see the sigmoid function in blue. And what you can see is that with the sigmoid functions, we can actually in a soft or in a differentiable way, if you will, approximate these non-differentiable step functions by uh, changing the parameters, changing the input weight, for instance. So here I've plotted multiple sigmoids. So this blue one is the sigmoid that we've seen before. But if we plot a sigmoid of 2x, we already see that it becomes closer to a step function. If you plot sigma of 5x, then uh, it becomes even closer to the step function. And at 50x, it becomes almost indistinguishable from the step function. So we have a differentiable alternative, a soft threshold function that we can tune such that it's sharp enough, but still differentiable um, for being trained with gradient descent based algorithms. Yeah, so some comments. The universi universality of two layer networks, so multi-layer perceptrons with one hidden layer is really appealing. Right. Universality means they can represent any possible function. But there is an important caveat, multiple actually. So first of all, they require exponential width. 
and this leads to an exponent, exponential increase in memory and compute time. At some point, at some complexity of the problem, we can still, we, we can simply not use these models anymore. And moreover, and maybe even more importantly, um, these models do not lead to generalization or universality doesn't mean or in, imply generalization, actually quite the opposite. If we are increasing the capacity, the number of parameters in the model exponentially, what it means is that the network simply memorizes the inputs. This is also what happened here, right? We, are, we have simply defined one hidden unit that memorizes one specific input. And this is of course not what we want because we want to have we want to achieve good performance on the validation set. We want to achieve low test error. We want to achieve a high degree of generalization to the test set. So memorizing uh, or simply overfitting doesn't really help us. In contrast, so this is one aspect that we have modified, the width of this network. We have kept, kept the depth the same. It's always two layers, but we have changed the width of the network. Now what's crucial now and what people just understood over the last couple of like 20 years or so is that actually um, what really matters is the depth of the networks. While you know, with this infinite wide networks, we can represent any function the representations are useless because we are basically just overfitting. But if we use deeper networks with less wide layers, we can represent complex functions more compactly. In other words, with less parameters. And these uh, deeper networks, they induce a very important inductive bias onto the solution space, which is, you can think of it as, you know, inducing the bias that complex functions can be modeled as composition of simpler functions. This is a very appealing property, right? Because simpler functions are easy to do and easier to understand and, you know, creating complex behavior from something simpler, that's, that's appealing. But it, it seems that it's actually true in nature and that this actually happens. And that's why deep networks work um, or generalize so much better than than just uh, using a, a shallow network. This is a non-deep network, like a two-layer MLP that is very wide and still universal. So these deep networks lead to more compact models and empirically better generalization performance. So there's also a simple binary example here, um, this parity function that I show here. It's a function of x1 to xd, which outputs one if the sum of these x's is odd and a zero if it's even. So this function, we can show that it requires an exponentially large shallow network in the number of inputs d. But it can be computed using a deep network whose size is just linear in the number of inputs. So it contrasts these two extremes very well. So here is some result from the paper of Montufar et al on the number of linear regions of deep neural networks. And this is about an intuition, like the, this, this, uh, the paper is theoretical, but this figure is an intuition of why um, deeper networks are useful. And this is called a space folding intuition. And it's an intuition for a specific activation function called the absolute value rectification unit, where we have basically just an absolute value as the activation function. It provides a geometric explanation of the exponential advantage of deeper networks as follows. So think of this white sheet here as uh, the space on which the input data lives. In this case, two dimensional, but it, it could be higher dimensional, right? It could be arbitrary high dimensional. And so what, what happens effectively with these uh, absolute value rectification units is that entities are mirrored onto um, along the axis defined by the hyperplane. So this is the mirror axis of symmetry, which is given by the hyperplane defined by the weight and bias of the respective unit. And so complex functions like the green one here arise simply as the mirrored images of simpler functions. You can think of this as a this sheet as a folding this sheet here multiple times, right? 
And you can see that we have multiple times we have a symmetry here. We have a symmetry at this axis, but then we have also additional symmetries here at this axis and the, at this axis, right? And so by, by folding this sheet of paper or space multiple times, we can very quickly with just a few, you know, layers, just by increasing the depth, adding some more layers, we can create very complex patterns for which we would need a lot of exponentially many neurons if we would want to keep the depth fixed and just increase the width of this hidden layer. So complex functions arise as in this case as mirrored images of simpler patterns and there's similar intuitions for other activation functions. So here are some empirical results finally. This is from the um, paper from Goodfellow et al. Um, on a task uh, of multi-digit multi number classification, um, which shows that deeper networks generalize better. On the x-axis, we have the number of hidden layers. And on the y-axis, we have the test accuracy. So effectively, uh, the inverse of the generalization error, higher is better. And you can see that the performance steadily increases when increasing the number of hidden layers. One difficulty with deeper networks is that they are harder to train. It's harder to backpropagate gradients because gradients can get lost, can, can explode and can vanish. So you need to take appropriate countermeasures like renormalization or skip connections, uh, etc., in order to counteract this. But this is something we'll discuss in, in a later lecture. But in general, if you design proper networks, you can get a huge benefit from depth that you can't get from width. And here's a comparison of this uh, effect of network depth versus width. Increasing the number of parameters is not as effective as increasing depth. So here's just this basically just a control experiment where for a network, let's say here, this one here, um, this is a convolutional neural network, which we'll talk about in uh, one of the following lectures. It's a very important type of network architecture with a very strong inductive bias. In addition to the bias of the layers, there's an additional inductive bias there that is very powerful for image recognition tasks, which is done here. So here we have a convolutional network with three hidden layers, and we have one with 11 hidden layers here. And you can see that with three hidden layers, if we just keep increasing the number of parameters, we at about 20 million parameters, we start um, to see a decline in test accuracy. And this is um, the overfitting effect. Right? We're overfitting, we, we are we're increasing the model capacity, but we're overfitting. However, if we're using a deeper network, we can increase the number of parameters more while still increasing test accuracy or improving generalization performance. So it seems also empirically that compositionality is a really a useful prior over the space of functions the model can learn. That's it for today.